This session's title is No Man, No Woman is an Island, and rather what we do is we need one another, and we live within a generation where we're at risk of becoming very narcissistic, solipsistic, which is just to say, you know, you alone exist and everyone else is just sort of a distraction to your personal, private uh, enterprises. And so today we're going to be talking about the necessity of friendship and why it's necessary for the Christian walk. When I grew up, I thought that when people would say, uh, you've been made in God's image, or that we've been made in God's image, I suppose I thought that meant somehow that God had an Australian accent or something, you know, (laughs) which I really hope that he doesn't, actually, because that would be totally awkward. I know some of you might think the Australian accent is cool. It's not. There's nothing epic about it at all. And we know that as Australians as well. And that's why when you go to our movie theatres... Um, when they advertise the movies that are coming, like, in the fall, we have Americans saying that, you know? Coming this fall, or something. Coming next summer. Or else, if we hired one of us to do it, it'd be like, coming next summer! It just, it wouldn't be epic. Like, if you think of any epic scene in an action movie, you know, like, like, just some epic line and swap it with an Australian. That's why Thor doesn't have an Australian accent. That wouldn't be right, it's not cool. But of course it doesn't mean that. We are not created in any way, or rather God is not created in our image, but we are created in his image. What does that mean? Well, to understand what that means, we need to look to maybe one scripture uh, or two in, in the Bible. If I was to ask you, you know, if you could sum up God in one word, what would it be? I might say, God is, hey, well done, love, big, hairy, not, not, not neither of those things. God is love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16, nerd, twice in the same chapter, okay, St. John says, God is love. Now, he doesn't say God is lovely, although he is. He doesn't say God is lovable, although he is. He says that God is love. So what is love? We use this word all the time in all sorts of crazy ways. You know, I say things like, you know, I love, you know, daredevil (laughs) tacos and I love my wife. It's like, okay, I hope you mean those things differently. You know, I love Jesus and I love this shoe. I don't know. You know what I mean? We just throw that word around a lot. Before I give you a more fuller explanation of what love is, I wanted to share with you Four quotations from young children, they were like six and seven years old, the teacher sat them down, gave them crayons and a piece of paper and asked them one question and they just had to respond. And the question was, what is love? Now you'll notice that the first two responses come from little girls, six and seven. The next two come from little boys. So that'll be fun, all right? First response from a six-year-old girl, love is when, oh, sorry, this one here. You know you love someone because your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. (laughs) That's cute. But if I was a teacher, I'm like, that's actually false. I don't know. (laughs) Not true. So good thing I'm not a teacher, to kids at least. The second one, ah. Um, love is when you, this is from a girl, love is when you tell a boy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. (laughs) Yeah, did you just feel the estrogen rise in this room? It was awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I spoke for an hour at men's session today. That sound never happened. (laughs) All right. This is from a six-year-old boy. Love. (laughs) Okay, what's awesome about these answers is these kids aren't trying to be funny. They're like, you ask me a serious question, I'll give you a serious answer. Go. What do you want? What do you want to know? I'll give you some wisdom. What is it? Question is, what is love? And this boy said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and then they go out and smell each other. Mm-hmm. The 
Now, this would have to be my favorite. This is from Jack, who is six years old. Again, just giving a straight answer. <laughs> Not trying to be a comedian, just saying it as it is. Ready? Love <laughs> is when mummy sees daddy on the toilet and she doesn't think it's gross. Now, when you compare what these kids are saying about love to say, you know, like what Fifty Shades of Stupid is saying or Cosmopolitan saying, I think they're doing a pretty good job, actually. But what is love? Let's break it down. For love to exist, there needs to be three things. There needs to be the one who loves, that is the lover. There needs to be the one who is loved. And there needs to be the love that they share, yeah? So you've got the lover, the beloved, and the love that they share. If you remove one of those elements, you don't have love. If you have, you know, the lover without the beloved, uh, that would be called stalking, I guess, right? <laughs> so cut that out. Uh, if you have the beloved without the lover, I guess that would be like fantasy or something where it feels like he likes me or something, but he doesn't know you exist, you know what I mean? And of course we need the love that they share. Another question, how many persons is God? Three, God is one being who is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is love, and for love to exist, there needs to be three things, and God is three persons. And so what we see in the Trinity is that the Father from all eternity has loved the Son. And that the Son from all eternity has received that love perfectly and given it back, entrusted himself back to the Father. And that this love that they share is so powerful and so profound that it is another person. It's the Holy Spirit. And this sheds new light on what it means to be created in the image and likeness of God. And there are different types of love. And in today's talk, we're going to be focusing mainly on friendship. But if you think of erotic love between husband and wife. You think of a husband and wife on their wedding day, what they promise with their lips uh, at, the, at the wedding, they then consummate with their bodies that night. They say, I'll give myself totally to you. And think about that beautiful act. The husband gives himself to his bride. The bride receives that love and her receptivity isn't passive. It's an active receptivity. And that love is so powerful that it always overflows. And sometimes, nine months later, you need to give it a name. <laughs> so, so if you ever met my wife and my kids, you know, if you want to know what my love is, like there it is, you know, pooing on the carpet over there. <laughs> this is love. But in our society, which has been incredibly pornified, it's like we don't comprehend what it could possibly mean to have affection for another human being that isn't sexualized because of the culture in which we live. Friendship is under massive attack. And so today we want to talk about friendship. I want to begin by reading you a quotation from sacred scripture. From the book of Sirach. Listen up. In here, the author talks about three types of friends and why it's important that um, we test our friends so that we don't just share our whole heart with everybody all the time as soon as we meet them, but that, that we be a little protective of our heart and that friendship is a great blessing. Listen to what he says. Let those who are friendly to you be many, but one in a thousand, your confidant. When you gain friends, gain them through testing and do not be quick to trust them. Now, to some of you, that might seem rather skeptical, like, oh, goodness, that's a little much. I mean, shouldn't we just trust everybody? But you only have to live a little. You only have to share a piece of your heart with somebody that really wasn't deserving of that part of your heart. And then they went and did something with that. And you know that we really do need to test these friends before they can become, in the words of Scripture, our confidant. Here are the three types of friends he talks of. Number one, for there are friends when it suits them, 
but they will not be around in time of trouble. We've all experienced that. Maybe all of us, many of us have been that friend who's no longer around in time of trouble because we just don't have the time. Well, that's what we say. Number two, another is a friend who turns into an enemy and discloses a quarrel to your disgrace. So you've shared a part of your heart, a part of your life, your struggles with this person, and they've turned around and they've disclosed this to other people. Number three, others are friends, table companions, but they cannot be found in time of affliction. When things go well, they are your other self. If disaster comes upon you, they turn against you and hide themselves. One of the best friends I ever had was a bloke by the name of Jacob Muldoon. Uh, we met each other when we were seven years old, and we did a lot of bad stuff together, uh, but we also did a lot of very good stuff together. And in my high school years, uh, there was a group of friends we used to hang out all the time, and we were really big into heavy metal. Um, I still like heavy metal, but back then I was really big into it, and um, I ended up buying this, uh, if you're familiar with Metallica, James Hetfield has a kind of signature guitar. I, I kind of bought one just like that, and all of my friends in the group got really jealous and started to turn on me. And it was one of the most difficult times of my life. Like, they shunned me. They made fun of me. They threw things at me. Like, it was really bad. And I couldn't sit with them at lunch anymore, but I had no other friends in the school, you know? I'd go sit with the cool kids, but, you know, they didn't like me, or I'd go sit with this group of people, but that was awkward. But my one friend, Jacob Muldoon, he just stuck with me during that time. And, uh, gosh, what a good friend. And I hope you've been blessed to have someone similar to that. He goes on to say, stay away from your enemies and be on guard with your friends. Faithful friends, like Jacob, my friend, or maybe a friend you know. Faithful friends are beyond price. No amount can balance their worth. Faithful friends are life-saving medicine. Those who fear God will find them. Those who fear the Lord will enjoy stable friendship. For as they are, so will their neighbors be. So I think we pretty much understand that what friendships are to some degree or another. But just like I said last night, sometimes we can become so familiar with words that we're really not sure what they mean. You know, if I said, what's a friend? You might say, well, someone I can trust and share my heart with and someone who I can enjoy life with or something like that. And those are all true. But C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia and he's an atheist convert to Christianity at Oxford University, has a very beautiful and poignant quotation on friendship, which I'd like to read to you because I think he sums it up in this one quote better than any other quote I've heard. Here's what he says. Friendship arises out of mere companionship when two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest or even taste which the others do not share and which till that moment each believed to be his own unique treasure. This is it. This is the beautiful bit. Listen, listen. The typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. Isn't that a beautiful way of summing up friendship? That you're a companion with this one person, all of a sudden you discover you both have this insight or this interest which then unites you. But the problem with friendship is in order to be a friend to someone, you need to be vulnerable. And that is really scary and really difficult, especially if you've been hurt in the past. And so the temptation is just to keep everybody at an arm's length and not invest anything real of yourself to them. Speaking again of what I mentioned a moment ago of this sort of solipsist insular culture in which we're constantly on our phones, unable to look up at another person and have an ongoing conversation. Because if I have a conversation, I can't bloody backspace that. And I might say something ridiculous that'll make me seem like an idiot, you know. That's scary. But in our culture where we've turned away from each other, we've turned away from God, we've turned into ourselves, what we find is not clarity. What we find 
brothers and sisters, is confusion. And you only need to look to the fact that if you're on Facebook, you can choose from one of over 50 genders on Facebook. That's insane. We're not becoming more clear about who we are or whose we are. We're becoming distraught and fractured and unhappy. But we need to turn back to him who is communion so that we can know who we are, whose we are, and how we ought to live. But vulnerability is a terrifying thing. Being real with another person, sharing your deepest stuff with another human being. Here's a quote from um, Lewis again when he talks about vulnerability. Listen. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. And if he lived in the 21st century, Netflix binges. Avoid all entanglements with people or animals. Lock your heart up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, your heart will change. It will not be broken, true, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love at all is to be vulnerable. There is a new phenomena that arose in Japan only recently, and it's now a word that's been picked up by the Oxford English Dictionary, and it's called a Japanese word, which is hikikimori, which is a Japanese word which means to withdraw or to draw in. And this word refers to the hundreds of thousands of young people and not so young people in Japan who have decided to cut off all relationships with human beings and animals for that matter, for the most part. Not just romantic sexual relationships, but relationships from friends, relationships from parents, all relationships entirely. And these people spend years, decades alone in their room. They get to play games. They get to order stuff from Amazon. They order food online. No one, no friend ever stabs them in the back. No one ever uh, rejects them. No one ever hurts them. But deep in this coffin of this fear and this selfishness, they're becoming hardened. I want to show you a little video that refers to this phenomena of hikikomori, and uh, we'll pick it up after that.
What I want to do is, for the rest of this talk, is two things. I'm going to ask three simple questions and then ask you for about a minute each to discuss with the person next to you uh, those answers. I'll only give you a minute, and so it'll be quick. And then after that, as we wrap up, I want to share four things that we ought to do uh, to maybe make ourselves more available and, and open to deepening in our friendships, because I don't know about you, but there were certain scenes in that Hikikomori uh, film that resembled my behavior from time to time. Like, here's a question, let's be honest. How many of you have, um, you, you go to bed, you're completely exhausted, and you're laying with the phones just watching one more or two more episodes of something on Netflix? We suck, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I do too. And I don't look much different to that guy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let me ask a couple of questions. And again, I'm going to ask a question and then say go. You'll have a minute to discuss it with a person or people next to you. You don't have to be strict about it. It might be one person or two people. Here's the first question. Uh, and then when I call you back, if you could just do your best to kind of bring the volume down so we can keep going on. The first question is this. It's very simple and very obvious, perhaps. Why is friendship a necessary Thing for me and, and for a healthy life. Go. Number two, what are the things in our day-to-day -day lives that are getting in the way of people, us, this generation, of being able to maintain and develop solid friendships? What are those things that are getting in the way? Final question, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience, and we're going to have a bit of a conversation. Very simple. Again, what makes a good friend? Go. Okay, begin to wrap up. All right, thank you so much. We asked three questions. Why is, why is friendship so necessary for human flourishing and our own flourishing? What is it that gets in the way of maintaining and developing good friendships? And then just what does it mean to be a good friend? I wanted to see if there's someone out there, just raise your hand and maybe share with us what you came up with, and I'll pass the mic. So if we could just listen up while they share, that'd be sweet. Thanks. Um, so we came to the conclusion that a good friend is someone who recognizes your flaws and turns them into strengths. Um, 
So an example would be um, if there are a lot of people out there who are introverted, I know that a lot of the time that can be something that you're shy and you're afraid to talk to people and you think a lot to yourself. Well, as an extrovert, I can say that I have a lot of friends who are very introverted, who are very, very intelligent people. And so to help them to be able to come out of their shell and realize that they have really intelligent thoughts and great things going on in their mind that they can share with the world that maybe people who spend more time talking or being extroverted would never have thought of. Thank you, Laura. Anyone else have any thoughts? Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Um, hi, my name is Alex. Um, for me, I felt like you can't always have expectations for a friend. You always want someone there to be truthful. You can't always have someone that's going to be positive about everything. You want to give them their real input. And for me, to actually care about someone and love someone, I always thought that you have to love an imperfect person perfectly. And it just shows that you can't always expect the best out of someone and you just want to grow up together and you just want to have that fire and that potential to always, you know, build new. Thanks. Yeah, I, along those lines of what you're saying, I thought like, you know, like, all, our only options for friends are just like broken people. Like, that's all we have to choose from. Just like people who are annoying, like you and me. That's it. That's all we have. <laughs> so let's be charitable with each other. Yeah, anyone else have something they want to say? All right. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, guys. I love you. Okay. So my name's Emily. I'm from St. Isaac Jokes in Pickering. Um, so two things. So... Being a good friend to somebody is being loyal and completely honest and knowing um, if you tell somebody something that's completely private to you and that's completely confidential, um, they're not going to share it with somebody else. And if it's going to harm you or if it's going to harm somebody else, they will do everything that they can that's in their power to help you. They will go to somebody else and be like, hey, you know, I have this friend that kind of needs some help, but they're afraid to say something. And one thing that bothers us um, as our generation is we are so engrossed in our phones that we don't even pay attention to the person across from us. And, you know, we never know what they're really feeling. And we can't tell that unless we actually talk to them face to face. Beautiful. <laughs> um, along, along with that thought, St. Thomas Aquinas, this is how he defines love, okay? He says that love is simply willing the good of the other. It's wanting the best for another person and doing what's reasonable to bring that about. And that sounds to me what you were saying, right? It's because I want the best for this person, I'm not going to take what they've shared to me intimately and tell other people, but because I want what's best for this person. If they tell me something about them harming themselves or harming another, because I want what's best for them, I can't, you know, in some situations, necessarily keep that a secret. I thought that was great. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, what we came up with was um, a good friend is someone who loves you unconditionally, no matter who you are, what you like, you know, um, Accepts you for who you are. Um, do you have anything to add? <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, that, okay. that's it. Ah, <laughs> uh, thanks. We'll do, we'll do one more. Hi, I'm Benjamin. Hi, Ben. Um, so... For me and a lot of other people, friends are someone who will be able to stick your, by your side through thick and thin. You're having your hard times, your down times, they'll be there for you. And you'll be there for them. Enough said. 
Awesome. Thanks, Benjamin. All right, one more, one more, one more. Okay. Um, my name is Dom, uh, and I think <laughs> uh, being a good friend is people like us, like trying to help our friends and help each other get to heaven. Like that's the goal for uh, trying to love each other and help each other get to heaven. Like uh, hang with the right crowd. Like don't give in to sin and you know come out here and see the joy that we all have. All right, thank you. Awesome, awesome. In men's session today, I was speaking about how people sometimes say, don't give in to peer pressure. And I said, that's true if your peers are idiots, right? But why would you, be, why would you and I be hanging out with idiots? What we ought to be doing is hanging out with people who are broken like us, yeah, who are hurting like us, who are annoying like us, but who are striving for holiness. If you are with people like that, you ought to give in to peer pressure. The peer pressure ought to be, hey, let's become saints. Done. <laughs> what I want to do is close with looking at four ways that we can get off this island. Huh? If no man is an island, if no woman is an island, then we need to learn how to do some particular behaviors that I think will help us not end up like a hikikomori. Okay? The first one is this. Fast from, and I'll explain what I mean, escape behaviors. Now, look, there are those of you in here like me, and then like there's times like your Netflix binge. There's times, this is what I did for a while. I'd be like bored or lonely or like whatever, just upset, and I go to my phone, and this is what I do. Email, one email. <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, email, Twitter, <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, email, oh, <laughs> Twitter, Instagram. What am I doing? What am I doing with my life? <laughs> now, what is an escape behavior? An escape behavior, listen, is that thing we turn to when we feel hurt, frustrated, rejected. And for a lot of us, a lot of people in this room, it's porn. Right? So you might be a young guy hooked on porn, and you might be a young girl hooked on porn. And by the way, can we give a round of applause if you agree with me that people should shut up and stop saying women don't struggle with porn? Please clap for that. It's insulting and it's false. But listen, the thing with porn is it's a very efficient escape behavior. So if I feel lonely or numb or bored or whatever, I turn to porn, I feel immediately excited, happy, right? Um, but you know like I do that that lasts for like three minutes, five minutes, however long, and then you get plunged back into that pit of isolation. My friend Audrey Assad, who um, struggled with porn a lot as a young woman, said that for men, she's like, men who are fighting to be free of porn, it's like they're in a prison cell, but they're at least all in there together, you know what I mean? And they're challenging each other, come on man, let's do this. And She's like, with women, with us, she said, it's like we're all in this prison, but we're in these isolated cells, and none of us know that the others are struggling. So what I want to say is a couple of things about porn, uh, but the first one is, to, to, we need to fast from these escape behaviors. So if you Netflix binge, if you play that particular game nonstop on your phone when you go to the toilet, how about just don't play with your phone on the toilet? You know what I mean? Like, I'm serious. I'm serious. A couple of lengths ago, that was my fast, that I wouldn't have screen time on the toilet. I'm sorry for the visual, but there it is, okay? <laughs> now, that seems like a really stupid, insignificant thing, but try it if you're one of these people like me who pulls out your phone. Like, not fast from these things. Now, of course, we should be fasting from sin all of the time, but when it comes to pornography, let's challenge each other. Now, one thing I want to do about porn is tell you a couple of things. Two things. One, if you've got a smartphone and you have Twitter... I said Twitter with an accent, because if I say Twitter, you go, what is this app? What is Twitter? If you go to Twitter, all right, if you type in, <laughs> shut up, if you, <laughs> hashtag free battle plan. If you type hashtag free battle plan, here's what you'll get. A free ebook that I wrote, Audrey Assad contributed to it. And you'll get two free talks, one from me to men on how to overcome porn, and one from Audrey Assad to women on how to overcome porn and masturbation, all right? Hashtag free battle plan on Twitter, and you'll get an automated response from me 
um, please do that and then share it. And if you don't have Twitter, you know, contact me over Facebook or something and I'll find a way to get you that link or just ask your friend to send you that link, okay? Hashtag? Free battle plan. The second thing I want to tell you about is my friend Mark Hart and myself just created an app called Victory. It's going to be on the Android in about two weeks, all right, or three weeks, we hope. But listen, here's what it is. It's this free app. You've got to have a password to get in. So your mum's like, oh, this is his fighting porn free you know, app, all right? You get a password. You go in, all right? And then it shows you a calendar. And the days you had setbacks, like masturbation or porn, you clock that in as a setback. The days you didn't are clocked as victories. So you look down at a calendar, and it says something like you've had three setbacks, five victories, okay? Morning, noon, and night, this thing checks in with you. How are you doing? Are you okay? Are you good? You're bad? And you might be like, I'm okay. In the evening, you might be like, I'm really tempted. So three. If you have a setback, if you look at porn or masturbate, you click that button, it takes you to a new page to assess your setback. Were you bored? Lonely, angry, stressed, tired. What was it that triggered you? What was the thing that got you thinking about looking at porn? Then what happens is every month you can look back and say, wow, I'm doing 22% better than last month. My number one trigger was this, at nighttime, in my bedroom, you know. You gain self-knowledge, and self-knowledge is such a key in overcoming this thing. One final thing I'll say about the app is that we've implemented this accountability button, which we've taken to calling the bat signal. Here's how it works. In settings, you can put up to three different accountability partners in. Please tell them before you do this. All right. Then let's say like you're really struggling. You're like, I totally want to look at porn, totally want to look at porn. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Ah! You click the bat signal, right? You click this accountability button. Three of your accountability partners, up to three, you might have just one, but up to three, get an alert on their phone, whether they're in the app or not. And it says, please pray for you know, Jenny, John, whoever. That's all. It doesn't say, please pray for John, who's a dirty little boy and is about to let... <laughs> no. Yeah, her mum stumbles across it. Oh, I knew it. That explains a lot. No, that's not what it is. Dude, it's just, it's subtle. It's subtle. It's subtle. Please download it. It's zero dollars and zero cents. It's called Victory. It's going to be on the Android in a couple of weeks. All right. Number two. So the first one was fasting from these things. Number two, we need to turn off our device and look up. This is what I do. Me and my friends will go out to dinner. What we do is we put our cell phones in the middle of the table. The first one to touch the cell phone pays for dinner. Turn off your cell phone, look up, look in people's eyes. Number three, find a friend this week. We, like the author in Sirach said, you don't need an army of people to be your confidants. That would be silly and not even possible. You just need one brother, or two brothers, one sister, two sisters that you can begin to share this stuff with. And like the author of Sirach said, don't be naive. Test that friendship. Don't share everything necessarily in that first encounter, but build that friendship a bit so that you can then have this accountability person maybe. Um, but find friends this week. If there was ever a place to find friends, it's this weekend. Do it. It's going to be awkward. Do it anyway. Okay, that leads into the final point. Final point. Are you ready? Are you ready? Final point. It's okay. Listen. Listen. Look. It's okay to be awkward. Most times, I feel like Napoleon Dynamite on a good day. It's slightly better. Like, I feel awkward. I meet people, hey, how's it going? Yeah. So, so, hey, Jew. So, Toronto. Uh, right? But look, here's the thing. It's okay to be awkward. Just don't flee. Don't flee back into your escape behavior. Stand your ground and allow it to be awkward. Forget call. Call is dead. Awkward is the new call, okay? Let's just, it, look, when, when you got on that bus or in that car with your different colored t-shirts, you left cool goodbye anyway, all right? So let's just all be awkward together, can we? Uh, and let's just give people the benefit of the doubt. If it's awkward, that's totally okay, totally okay. Just don't flee, don't flee, don't flee.